Hello and welcome to the Lawyer's Coach podcast. This is the final episode of Series 6 and we're doing things a little bit differently. Instead of bringing in a guest, our normal hosts, Claire Rayson and Oliver Hansard, both of whom are coaches and former lawyers, have been interviewing each other. The theme of this series has been culture, and they'll be speaking about the impact that culture has on diversity through the lens of a study with a difference. They'll also explore the impact of the billable hour on culture. Is this the elephant in the room that needs to change before anything else can work? Here's Oliver to kick things off. So Claire, I've just put down uh, your class of 2002 report, which looks at where the intake uh, that you were uh, part of at Herbert Smith Freehills, where their careers have gone since then. Fascinating read. Um, would love to, to understand the genesis of, of that report and where the idea came from and how the, the project emerged. Yeah, so I think it probably started over a glass of wine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's the best ideas always do that. That's the best ideas always do. So yeah. Yeah, I was chatting to my other half and we were reflecting on, you know, we both started in, in very different environments. I started life in, in the law and my husband started life um, in the foreign office. And we were reflecting on, you know, 20 years ago when we both started, you know, there was a big drive towards um making sure that the numbers that they were seeing at, at kind of intake level were were going to be reflected through at leadership level. So in the context of, of my intake in, in partnership roles. So I thought, you know, actually it'd be quite interesting to see what had happened to the intake that I started with and um, went online, did a bit of research on LinkedIn. Um, and what I was seeing was pretty concerning um, because actually lots of the the women that I remembered hadn't made um, and we'll talk about how, whether whether you've made it or not when you get to partner. But um, lots of the women um, not in partnership positions and the men that I remembered, you know, were in partner roles. So I thought, well, it'd be interesting to to actually get the full data set because my memory, um, my memory was probably failing me to see, you know, what happened. Um, and um, Herbert Smith Freehills were very generous and, and they helped me remember the, uh, the, the the full data set. And off I went. And um, yeah, the, the, the numbers were pretty, um, pretty shocking. So we started off around 57 percent female. And we ended up um, with 73 percent of that intake staying in the law, staying in fee earning roles with a roughly equal gender split and uh, normally here and I'm talking to someone I ask them um, what they think the numbers were but you've read it so I have (laughs) yes so I can't tell you I can't get you to guess but um, only 23% of the women were hitting that highest level so either partner or GC versus 59% of the men um, which you know and I cut the data in, in different ways but whichever way I cut the data there was this big divide between women who had hit that highest level and the men. And the key drivers of that difference? The the two main reasons come back to culture. Um, one of those reasons was this always on culture, um, you know, which we can we can discuss. Um, and then the other one, which for me was also something that linked to culture. So I think often with culture, we think about how we do things around here. Um, but I think in law firms, because of the way that they're set up, because they're partnership models, you know, the partners are very much part of the culture. I mean, you know, we often say that culture comes from the top. Um, and I think who does things around here is really important when we think about partnerships. Um, so what I what I did, I I asked people to identify traits that they saw in themselves, um, both the, and I kind of split it male and female I split it partner and non-partner um, and I also asked people to identify traits that they saw in um, in their leaders um, and the results were interesting so the traits that people identified in themselves um, friendly collaborative um, intelligent probably not surprising being um, being lawyers in, in a city firm focused relationship building 
Um, the difference, actually, because men and women identify very similar traits, uh, women tended to say um, empathy as one of the traits that they identified. Um, and the men identified as being logical in a way that the women um, didn't put that in their kind of top, top five, top ten. Um, but what was interesting was when we started thinking about um, partners and some of the words here were words that people didn't necessarily identify in themselves. So words like ambitious and assertive and competitive. And I think these are words that, um, you know, can be difficult words for women to associate with, especially this this assertive word where you know there's lots of research around um, the impact of of. Um, you know kind of women are penalized for being assertive in the workplace um and um and what was interesting to me and um something that I've kind of had many conversations since the report and I've reflected on this and why are these words ones that we assess, associate with partners and and for me I think you know they are words that are needed perhaps um in a, in a culture where you know this 24/7 um you know the more you build the, the better you are culture um i think that that they are linked so for me you know culture plays a big part in all of this um and you know we've had chris this series talking about mental health and the impact you know mental health in the profession we've had elizabeth talking about burnout and how di different points pinch points in people's careers where that comes through so for me I think you know this inequality that we see at the top still is just one symptom of something bigger. Choice seems to come into it as well and that that men and women have different choices and ranges of choices they can make during their career. Did you see that as a significant um, impact on, on routes people took? Yeah so that was that was I guess one of the things that surprised me so I kind of went through and, and, you know, found what I found. But when I was talking to people and I spoke to lots of women, I spoke to lots of men, I spoke to lots of coaches who coach leaders. And one of the things that was interesting was that I really noticed a difference between um, women who perhaps had, had decided to, you know, stop at senior associate level or perhaps were in-house and, you know, didn't want to, to kind of carry on through to GC. Um, and they were quite happy with the choices that they had made. And, you know, they recognised that they had to make a choice. And for many, it was a, a kind of a work life balance. But actually, for some of them, it just, you know, didn't look attractive. It didn't look like much fun. Um, so they didn't want to, to kind of carry on up through. Um, contrasted, actually, with some of the men that I spoke to. So some of the men that I spoke to had decided not to, to carry on up and they'd stepped away from the law and they were doing different things. And actually, they, you know, spoke to me about how, you know, it was a real challenge for them to do that and how they, you know, had lots of people that had kind of questioned the choices that they had made in a way that women didn't seem to, to, to you know, struggle with that. Um, and similarly, I spoke to some, um, you know, very senior male partners who you know had reached a point in their career maybe their children kind of gone through university and they decided to perhaps take a step back um and had really struggled with this idea of identity where their identity had been very much wrapped up in um being a partner being a leader um and actually the choice to step away was was much more difficult so um for me this idea of choice is interesting because if you think about where we end up <laughs> so you end up with you know more men at the top than 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 women um and within that you've probably got you know a a cohort of men and women who are quite happy with the choices that they've made they know what they're signing up to um they're getting well remunerated let's be honest um and you know and and, and are happy where they are but you then get um a chunk of women who say well actually no that's not for me i'm going to stop here and those choices aren't necessarily questioned or um, challenged. They can they can stay there and, and that's accepted. Um, but you can then get some men who actually carry on up, regardless of whether they think that's the right thing for them. Um, so you end up with this, you know, disproportionate number at the top. So the women stay down at the level that they stay and the men stay up. So 
for me, that's interesting because I think you often try and solve inequality or in- inequity at the top by focusing on the women and thinking about, well, what can we do to, to make the women fit, to make the women want to get up? rather than challenging okay well what have we got at the top and how can we reward different styles of leadership um so that actually it becomes a choice that is more palatable to um to men and women um and i think that's something that we still you know we still struggle with i think in in firms and and by implication then it's the men that need to do more of the changing than the women rather than thinking okay we've got to, we've got to coach women to be more adaptive into into a sort of more male um set of behaviors it's actually the other way around it, it's it's how do we then make men um change the culture of a business be more adaptive be better allies maybe for women and and, and drive equality that way i think so and and in one of the reflections again that i've had since writing the report and you know it's quite clear from the get-go that you know, are we treating the symptoms rather than the cause? And actually, the cause of, you know, the statistics that I found is cultural, and culture has an impact on on many things and on many people. And I think, you know, often, when we talk about, you know, trying to get more women into leadership, I've, you know, spoken now at numerous events, and you know the men are always absent from the conversation and I <laughs> yeah. think until yeah. we get yeah. the men into the conversation things aren't going to change and I'd love to hear from you actually Ollie because you know actually you're one of the the exceptions because you do I know you've been to some of the events that I've spoken at and um, this is something we've spoken about before and I just wonder what we can do to get more men involved and more men you know interested in the conversation it's a really, really big question, and it and it, and it's a hard one because the risk is that you have a cohort or, or a generation of women who are so exactly the saying the right things, but they're saying them to the wrong people. And I think I think really it's at, at the heart of it, it it's bravery from men to say you know the the route I've come and and, and the world I currently inhabit doesn't need to stay the same. And we can have equality at every single level um, of the organisation and in, in every level of people's life, really, um, and, and design it that way to assume um, equality rather than as, assume that a certain cohort or gender of people will adapt. So I think it's about making men braver, being more present in the conversation and being more honest about whether or not you know they've made the choice they really want to make. So, Oli, it'd be interesting because you obviously started life in a city firm um, and, you know, we sit here and, and you know, you didn't. And again, make it is is, is perhaps not the right word, but, you know, you, you made the choice to step out. And I'd just be interested to hear from you about, you know, the impact that, you know, when you took that choice, made that decision. Um, you know, was it a difficult one for you? It was actually quite an easy one really i found um so i went from law firm and became general counsel um and i i didn't enjoy the work enough and it was driven it was driven um less less by stepping out of um you know the the pressures of a career to just not enjoying the day to day but the, the reason why i i asked those questions around choice is that i think I, as a, a man and a father and a, and a family man first, felt that I had little choice, had very few choices during my career. Um, I, I always felt an expectation to be the, the breadwinner and to be the one driving um, forward in my career, much to my wife's detriment. I mean, we, we, had, a, we had a joke at, um, at Dunhumby, which was uh, my boss had uh, hired the wrong Hansard because um my my wife is far cleverer and um and and more driven than me um and and i think you know it was because i was a man that um uh, i felt that obligation to to have that career path um and um and it was to as i say it was to my to my wife's detriment um so it was you know the the stepping out came if you like really towards the end when my kids were older and i was I was more able and more, if you like, settled in my in my personal 
situation. Um, but but for me, my 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 career really, you know, has an emphasis of yeah, lack of choice all the way through. That this is something I have to do. Um, and would I have done the same thing if I I really um, could have designed it myself? And I and I think I would have done something quite different. Just taking a quick break from Claire and Oliver's conversation to let you know that there is a way to find out more about the class of 2002 Women in Law report. You can download a copy for free at clienttalk.co.uk. Back now to Claire and Oliver. I think, I, you know, one of the, the reflections that I had from this series was when I was talking to Chris and... He mentioned about, you know, when he was at a crossroads in his career as a partner, he was able almost to, with a blank sheet of paper, say, look, this is what I think I can bring to the partnership. And, and you know, here you go. And I quite like this idea of being able to have more control over your own path, because I think, you know, in law firms, there's, there's very much a sense of if you want to be partner, you have to tick the right boxes and you have to demonstrate the uh, the business case and that's often comes back to to fees and and clients but you know if you had to design your career what would you have done differently and what would the firm or company that you were in have had to have done to accommodate that really with a blank sheet of paper I think I, I would have designed it in a way that my wife and I were working the same amount and in the same way with the same degree of success and same degree of responsibility and and both have had that opportunity to shine equally um and i think that that um requires organizations back to how do we get this done um that requires organizations to accept that a a man's uh, contribution or work style is probably the right well, I'm not even sure what the right, right way to describe it is but the way the man works within an organization mirrors how how their partner or women work in in organizations and the expectation is is less that they will be always on that they will have the um an equal share in the responsibilities and to be at home and maybe sometimes not to be there. Um, but again, I think we're quite a long way from organizations operating like that. But I think I think there's something in that that, that is really important to, to driving that equality that that um, is so important. One of the things I tried to do with the report was to really give my perspective as a coach, which you know, you mentioned what was the driver for the report and and you know a glass of wine and a chat with my husband was one of them but actually one of the other drivers that I had was a you know a coaching conversation that I had with a female leader who was really struggling with this idea of you know I don't fit the mold of a leader how can I change to to be this leader that I feel like I need to be um and working with her to show her that you know, actually, what are you trying to achieve and why do you have to achieve it in the same way as other people? You know, what what do you bring? And, and you know, you can achieve the same results in a different way. Um, and I think that as coaches, we we often have conversations that, you know, we're, we're lucky to have because we get insights into what's really going on inside people's minds um, in a way that, you know, I think many don't. When you coach male leaders, do you think what you've just described to me is, you know, unique to you? Or do you think actually a lot of men struggle with this notion of identity and, you know, I have to be the breadwinner and I have to keep on going up because that's what's expected of me? I think men struggle with that every day. It's something that's tolerated as opposed to something that is openly discussed and um, the um senior lawyers are, are, are driving to change now if i'm if i'm really honest um you know i probably coach more women uh than men um and it, you know 
very broadly a lot of the challenges that that the women i coach face with are are, are based from the fact that they they even though they might work in the same law firm they work uh, in in quite a different almost social environment to their their male counterparts and so i think on the one hand there's a generation of women who are really keen to deal with these sorts of challenges yet there are not enough men who are aware and engaged in that in the debate that needs to happen to drive those changes and what do you think we need to do to get those men engaged have more conversations like this open it out and bring men into the room the danger of 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 it being a um there i think there is a danger of it being a too much of a um a closed conversation you need to bring this out and, and 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 make men feel engaged in it not threatened by it but also able to have an honest conversation about it you know whenever there's an opportunity and uh, i guess kind of leading on from that you know one you know and, uh, we're talking about you know lots of different things here but you know the whole series has been about culture and i think one of the challenges with firms with companies is you know changing culture is difficult it takes time and you know when we think about law firms in particular you know they are extremely profitable the model works um from a profit perspective it works for um you know a large number of as i said you know the many partners are happy with where they've got to they're happy with their lifestyle they've made choices that are very much in line with what they want how do we you know let's you know let's take the billable hour for example which you know links back to some of the traits that i mentioned it's you know been mentioned you know actually in different ways across the series as being something that is a challenge you know how do we get firms to think about um changing the billable hour when actually it works and it has worked for for so many for so long and that's the challenge if it if it works for an organization or for an industry there's a massive disincentive there's no incentive for that to be changed um and if you've got people at the top who are leading an organization of that's all they've seen through their their careers to make them change that will be really tough so um it's going to again take a really brave organization to um to make those sorts of changes um but but maybe maybe that that's maybe that's you know align that bravery with the bravery of the way in which um people can operate within the business you know maybe the two things go hand in hand um and and maybe there's, there's somebody somewhere or a firm somewhere who who really steps out and makes that change i suppose the reality is though will that firm that does that you know from a potentially an internal perspective will they be able to meet client needs externally and will that be the inhibitor to make make those sorts of changes don't know and it's interesting isn't it because you mentioned um clients and you know dan kind of the voice of the client again on this series talking about how you know the billable hour is something that many clients don't like um because actually you know it rewards inefficiency you know no one likes to be told well you know how long is it going to take well you know it, who knows but that's this is what we're going to charge per hour and actually it's interesting when i talk to firms often um there's you know you, you, two conversations running in parallel so on the one hand well actually clients we we recognize that clients don't like the billable hour we actually do most things on a fixed fee basis um we want to embrace technology we want to reward efficiency we want our people to be um mentally and physically happy and and healthy um yeah on the other side there seems to be a real reluctance to get rid of the billable hour because actually it's an easy measure of productivity it's an easy way for us to be able to manage our systems internally and almost a you know closed off to well there must be another way to be able to manage 
our people and to manage whether our people are, are being you know as productive and as efficient as possible without having the the billable hour there maybe it is the case claire that that confronting the billable hour challenge will enable businesses to completely rethink um their business models um how they uh, manage their resources their people um and you know that can be the driver of of really the modernization of the um uh, uh, of law firms because you know we hear so much from guests that that things are stuck and that change is required maybe that's the starting point maybe that's the discussion that we need to open out that if we go from challenging billable hours that means we can we can deal with this always on culture we can we can deal with the inequalities with the the out the the, the inevitable outcome of losing all this great talent um um through through careers um, you know, maybe there's really something in that. Yeah, and I think, you know, as we come to a to a close with this series, you know, perhaps thinking about the billable hour and and how can it be done differently um, is a great topic for for next series. Let's do that. Let's get leaders in. I think we need to get clients in as well and have a really serious conversation about is this the, the right way forward for clients, for businesses, for people coming through for future lawyers, because if that's an inhibitor to change, um, all the change that we so often hear needs to be made um, in the industry will, will be prevented. That sounds like a really exciting topic. I really enjoyed doing this series um, with you, Ollie. We've had some fantastic guests as always, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to digging into the Bill of Allower next time. Absolutely, Claire, you're a legend as always, and, and great working with you. That was Claire Rayson and Oliver Hansard bringing season six of the Lawyers Coach podcast to a close. If you've enjoyed this, then please rate on your podcast provider so that others can find us. It's also well worth checking out the previous five series of the podcast where the themes have been empathy, success, law 2.0, beyond law and the skills lawyers need. If you are a lawyer and would like to take part in Lawyers Coach, then please visit our website, lawyercoach.co.uk, for further details. And you can also join the conversation on our LinkedIn group, Lawyers Coach. Thanks for listening and goodbye.